So in what seems like another lifetime ago, in November of 2018, uh, this project released the Minnesota Solar, Poten uh, Solar Potential Inlet Report, uh, which presented the findings of modeling done by Clean Power Research and incorporating feedback from all of you on the generation costs of solar Minnesota in relation to its goal of getting to 10% by 2030, uh, and then looking at solar and wind generation costs as far out as 2050 under different scenarios. During the review and after the release of the report, one of the most common pieces of feedback from the core team uh, was that looking at Minnesota alone provided you know, interesting data, but it would, be, it would be very helpful to look at the entire MISO service territory uh, that Minnesota is obviously a part of and interacts with on a minute by minute, second by second basis. So to that end, um, a MISO wide solar potential analysis was added to the scope of work of the project and Mark Perez and the folks at Clean Power Research are here today to present the uh, findings and fruit of that labor. We'll ask to hold, if you please hold your questions until the end um, or as they come to you, um, either jot them down or pass them along via the chat function of, the, of Zoom. Um, we'll record them and pass them along uh, in a wrap up email in case we don't have time to get to them at the end. Um, as well as a link to the recording of today's webinar. Uh, last item, uh, the fi these findings aren't yet public, so please don't quote, cite, or distribute anything in the slides today. A public-facing version of this presentation um, will occur at the April 13th gathering of Solar Minnesota, um, following some content review from the, from the DOE. So if you're interested in, fur in further than that, please reach out to my, me, Ben Martin. Um, and with that, I will pass it off to Mark Perez of Clean Power Research. Take it away, Mark. Perfect, well, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as was mentioned, this is a follow-on to the Minnesota Solar Pathways work. And it uses the same uh, core model where we're trying to um, guarantee load, a specific load target. In Minnesota, we, uh, we tried to hit 10% uh, solar um, by 2025 with, uh, certain certain conditions. Uh, there's some must run resources included in that. Um, and then we push the envelope to 70% uh, renewables by 2015. We optimize the relative proportion of wind and solar. Uh, we introduced the concept of uh, overbuilding and curtailment. So oversizing the renewable uh, assets and capacity terms in order to minimize the need for storage. All this uh, all these concepts will be used in uh, figuring out how we can actually meet MISO load, which is much larger, obviously, and uh, we're gonna investigate some of the cost benefits. So without further ado, why 100% across MISO? Um, well, there's an environmental prerogative, obviously, and that's the same as um, we have in the state of Minnesota. There's a socioeconomic prerogative um, and, and there's particularly a socioeconomic prerogative with respect to uh, the external costs, so the externalities, which are linked to the environmental, which is linked to the environmental prerogative, but also uh, there's a socioeconomic prerogative to try to minimize cost if what we wanna do is meet the environmental prerogatives. So we can't break the bank when trying to go to 100% or very high penetrations of renewables. And in looking at MISO, it helps set a realistic high watermark for costs when firmly meeting load with high levels of renewables. So MISO, uh, MISO already is investigating high penetrations of renewables, but to my knowledge, they haven't fully looked at 100% uh, renewables uh, in exactly this context. And we have a unique model that allows us to look at these, uh, these kinds of questions. So we've shown that the energy transformation can be cost effective across the state of Minnesota uh, using optimized capacity expansion and dispatch uh, model that we use uh, that I just mentioned. Will these same uh, concepts hold true for MISO? Are they as effective? Um, so the solar and wind resource have very different spatial and temporal characteristics across the territory. And how does this affect cost? This uh, on the left is the uh, capacity factor of latitude tilt uh, solar power across the state. And I haven't put a legend on here just to not fill up the space, but red, you have a higher capacity factor and blue, you have a lower capacity factor. So you can see that in the Southern part of the MISO territory, you have a lot more solar resource. It's a lot more, um, it, your one kilowatt of solar at latitude tilt produces a lot more 
than it does up in, uh, up in Michigan. And the opposite is true for wind. This is the wind capacity resource, uh, a map created out of Stanford that I've extracted for the MISO territory. And as you can see, there's a lot more wind resource up in the uh, northern regions of the state and a lot less wind resource in the south. So can those uh, spatial differences play off each other in MISO? That's an interesting thing to look at. What value does an interconnected MISO region deliver in terms of uh, reduced energy cost relative to smaller subregions? Uh, like the state of Minnesota or load resource zones, which I'll discuss. Um, does it even deliver value in those terms? Is, uh, is Minnesota better off islanding themselves or are they better off collaborating with the surrounding region? You know, is it better to isolate individual regions or is it better to inter interconnect across the MISO? You know, what, what are the value adds in, in those terms? Finally, how does a 100% renewable optimized capacity expansion portfolio change with the cost of system components over time? And this is something we looked at for the Minnesota Solar Pathways portion of the work. Uh, we had different uh, cost scenarios based that were tied to time. So we had a 25, 2025 cost scenario, um, and we had a 2050 cost scenario. And then within each of those, we had a high and low uh, uh, technological development. So high technological development, lower cost, low technological development, uh, higher cost for each of those dates. So we'll look at those same uh, types of portfolios. So MISO is already planning for the transition uh, via the MISO forward um, uh, process or program uh, that you may or may not be familiar with. So on the left is the current breakdown of uh, capacity um, within the MISO territory. So this is the conventional uh, perspective it's mostly gas, or it's the majority of it is gas. Then you have coal, a little bit of renewables and nuclear. Most of the renewables is, uh, is the wind power in, in the region. And then the new mix that uh, they're considering, they call it renewable reinvention, um, pushes the envelope on, uh, on renewables significantly and bring the renewables up to 50%. And what we're gonna look at here specifically is uh, the future mix, 100% renewables. Um, and not to say that this is what MISO should do. It will just set a high watermark for costs and it'll help inform this process. This is kind of the high bar for, uh, you know, for, for where MISO could go. It's, it's a potential future. So uh, firstly, some characteristics regarding the MISO region, just pictured at left. I mean, you might be able to tell um, you know, where you are in this region. This is the middle third of the United States. The, uh, the bottom part is uh, Louisiana. So these little islands and, and stuff, this is, uh, this is the Louisiana coast down here. And up here are the Great Lakes that you can kind of see outlined. Extruded from the shape here of MISO is uh, Chicago. Chicago actually isn't part of the MISO region. It's been cut out. Um, it's, not, it's not part of it. There are some far flung suburbs of, of Chicago, I suppose, that are part of MISO, but not Chicago itself. So the load is 120 gigawatt peak and about 670 terawatt hours per year. Large amount of energy, much bigger than uh, Minnesota. Uh, in terms of renewables, currently they have 21 gigawatts of wind and 330 megawatts of PV. So wind, uh, there's really been an envelope pushing on wind and most of that is in the northern part of uh, the MISO region, um, corresponding to the, to the wind resource that I had shown earlier. In terms of geography, geography it can be further subdivided into three macro regions, each of which we'll study individually in this process. Um, and it's further subdivided into 10 load resource zones, which are pictured here at the left. Um, so the state of Minnesota is in, uh, is in zone uh, one, I believe. So the resource, uh, there are vastly different resource characteristics. I'd shown that map uh, earlier. Um, so let's examine what these characteristics um, look like on optimized capacity expansion and the cost of the result. So load resource zone three, I've highlighted over there on the left, and there's a little arrow coming down to the right. On the right-hand side, this is a plot of the uh, monthly average wind and solar resources within this region in terms of the monthly capacity factor. So the blue line is the wind capacity factor on the monthly, monthly time average, and the yellow is a solar um, resource on a monthly time average. You can see that the wind capacity factor 
is much higher than the solar capacity factor, at least in this zone. If we go to a different zone, the picture is very different. In zone 10, the solar capacity factor is actually much higher than the wind capacity factor. Um, the wind blows le less than it does uh, in the north, and the sun is a little bit stronger than it is in the north. So how do we optimize capacity expansion and dispatch? Um, enter the clean power transformation model. So this is what we've called the same model that we used for the Minnesota Solar Pathways phase one uh, part of this process. This model optimizes capacities and dispatch of the following technologies. On the generation side, we have wind, solar, and in, in, it can include dispatchable generation like gas. Um, the dispatchable generation could be something else. It could be hydrogen product production, or uh, it could be any type of gas, biogas or landfill gas or something like that. Um, in terms of balancing technologies, we have electricity storage and implicit storage, like overbuilding and curtailment. Um, and just came up with this, this logo here because essentially implicit storage, which, which is the rebranded uh, name that we've come up with uh, recently, is what we're calling overbuilding and curtailment because it has the same effect as uh, conventional storage. And, I, and I'll show why that is in a little bit. The optima optimization in this model is LCOE based. And there are four scenarios that include component cost characteristics that have been developed from the latest uh, 2019 NREL uh, annual technology baseline, the ATB. So in 2050, we have high and low technological development, just like we did for Minnesota. And in 2025, we have high and low technological development. Here are the costs. I won't read them in great detail, but if you want to look back over the slides later on, there are capital costs and operating costs for PV, wind, and storage efficiencies. And for storage, uh, we've added, um, we have two, we've differentiated the capital cost. We don't only have a capital cost per kilowatt hour. We also have a capital cost per kilowatt. So before the capital cost for storage was only per kilowatt hour and that had the bundled energy and capacity portion. Now it's been differentiated uh, in accordance with what the um, NSRDB has, has presented in their latest, latest um, or so that the ATB has presented in their latest version. And this is possible because we, um, if you remember last year, I think it was when we looked at the hydrogen and electrochemical storage hybridization that I presented here, um, we, we tweaked the model so that it can accept, accept these two different uh, types of costs. And that was only made possible by, by that work. And then we have the same thing for gas in case we want to include a, a little bit of gas in the model. So these four scenarios are run for 14 different geographic zones, the 10 load resource zones, the three regions, and the MISO as a whole that I had shown on the previous page. Each region uh, has its own distinct load shape and resource characteristics. So they're all different. The, the wind could blow more strongly in some regions, uh, and the solar could shine more strongly in some regions, and the load could have a different, uh, or, or does have a very different magnitude and shape relative to these different resources. So the, the, uh, the amount of the, the optimal blend of the resources, wind versus solar, um, and the degree of oversizing all depends on the match between the load and the resource itself. Um, so it provides some interesting results. So all in all, with these uh, scenarios, we've run 23, over 23,000 year-long hourly interval dispatch simulations that were performed in seeking the optimal across these 56 different scenarios, both including um, cost and uh, geographic location. So let's dive into some of these. Uh, let's focus on zone seven, load resource zone seven first. So consider load resource zone seven in 2025 with a low degree of technological development with PV alone and no overbuilding whatsoever. So we can optimize PV overbuild to minimize costs and, and we might want to um, because uh, if, if we size PV specifically to meet load on an energy basis, we need about 66 gigawatts in this case. So on the, on the, in this plot here, you have um, a, a log scale on the y-axis and this is the monthly average gigawatts. The red line is the load. So you can see it's uh, summer peaking, but there's still a, a pretty big chunk of uh, load in the, in the winter. 
Um, so it's generally flat throughout the year with a little bit more in the summer. Um, the PV resource is certainly summer peaking, obviously, because we're pretty far north here. Um, and if we size PV on an energy basis to meet load throughout the year with the 66 gigawatts uh, for this zone, we have a significant summer surplus and we have significant winter shortfalls. So we can optimize this PV overbuild. Um, if, we, if, we don't, if we only size PV on an energy basis like we've done here with 66 gigawatts, we need an incredible amount of storage because we need to take the uh, summer surpluses and feed that energy to meet the winter deficits. So the seasonal storage is incredibly large. So this is what's pictured here on the y-axis. You have uh, gigawatt hours. This is the storage state of charge. So in this case, we need around 13 and a half terawatt hours of storage, which is, in, which is huge. It's too large. This storage is also doesn't have a very high utilization factor because we only fill it once per year over here in uh, October. And we're, we're basically charging all summer and discharging all winter. So that, that's, it's, too, it's far too large. Um, and it's very expensive as a result. This is uh, on the y-axis, you have the levelized cost of electricity. And on the uh, x-axis, you have the percentage of curtailment. You've seen these plots before, but I'm only showing a portion of it. Um, with no curtailment whatsoever, with no overbuilding, um, we have an enormous cost of storage. And this is a stacked area plot. So the light red portion is the portion of the LCOE that comes from the storage energy component. Dark red part is the piece that comes from the storage power component. And the yellow part is the, is the piece that comes from PV. So PV, if we size it on an energy basis, it doesn't contribute a huge amount to uh, the total LCOE, but the storage energy component is enormously expensive. And that means that to meet load in zone LRZ7 uh, with PV plus storage with no overbuilding, we're at over a dollar per, uh, per kilowatt hour, which is exceedingly expensive. It, it just won't happen that way. So we can optimize PV overbuild to minimize cost. So we've uh, done about 2.6 X overbuild. It happens to be the optimal in this case. So you can see PV is now, now has a year round surplus. There, there are no, in this monthly average of PV generation, this 174 gigawatts, uh, there's never a, there's never a monthly period where we are less than uh, less than a load. So it's a year round surplus. There are obviously PV um, solar, um, the sun is only up during the day. So PV is only producing during the day. So you still need some storage to overcome the nighttime shift. But these long systemic uh, month long imbalances between um, the, the resource and the load are evaporate if you overbuild to this degree. So the storage state of charge, same y-axis as before, is significantly lower. This is the storage state of charge for the entire year um, when, we've, uh, when we've overbuilt 2.6x. So instead of being over a terawatt hour of storage, we now only need uh, 719 gigawatt hours of storage. We, we needed 13 terawatt hours before, and now we've reduced it by, um, by, by an order of magnitude almost. So the storage size is significantly diminished. Um, and on the LCOE plot that I had shown before, we can reduce it significantly. And we find the sweet spot. So uh, some of you may be familiar with this plot. I, I'd shown it before for the Minnesota work. Stacked area plot. The yellow part is PV. The red portions are from storage. So you can see as we uh, increase the degree of overbuilding, as we move to the right on this graph, we increase the amount of curtailment and the uh, amount of energy storage decreases almost exponentially. And you can see the red portion getting smaller and smaller. But meanwhile, the uh, yellow portion is getting larger and larger because we're overbuilding, so we need some more. Uh, we, we have, uh, the PV is bigger than before for the same amount of energy, so the yellow portion gets bigger and there's a sweet spot. And in this case, it happens to be uh, 26.9 cents per kilowatt hour, which is still pretty expensive, uh, PV alone. Um, and just to show you this implicit storage concept, um, this margin on the PV, uh, this green portion that I've highlighted here, this is the implicit storage piece, uh, piece. So this is the margin on the PV capacity relative to what we need on an energy basis. And this, this margin on the capacity 
functions exactly like storage. So you can see that's the piece that goes up exponentially. And we're calling it implicit storage because it's doing kind of the same thing that, that storage is doing. So the, red, the green portion is implicit storage. The red portion is uh, regular storage. The yellow portion is PV. In, in reality, the green portion is extra PV capacity, but we're just calling it implicit storage. It's just a semantic thing. So 2025, load technological development in MISO load resource zone seven with 100% PV plus storage is roughly 26.9 cents per kilowatt hour. And that's with 174 gigawatts of PV and 719 gigawatt hours of storage. So let's look at the impact of price. Um, let's look at 2050 high scenario, which is our lowest price um, cost scenario. So that 2025 low is our highest cost scenario, 2050 high is our lowest cost scenario. So we see a 70% reduction in LCOE in 2050, and that's largely linked to the drop in uh, storage cost and the drop in, in PV cost. The storage is expected to drop considerably in price and PV is also uh, expected to drop considerably in price. So now at no curtailment, we're at 46 cents per kilowatt hour. Before we were at, we were way up here, we were at over 150 cents per kilowatt hour. And at the optimal point, we're at roughly 7.9 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so I've just highlighted this little point here. This is where we were before um, at the optimal point in 2025 at the high cost scenario. We were at roughly 26.9 cents per kilowatt hour. So we've reduced significantly. We dropped from the black point here to this optimal uh, sweet spot down here. So 2050 high technological development, MISO load resource zone seven, 100% PV plus storage, 7.9 cents per kilowatt hour. And that's with the same amount of PV and storage. We've just changed the costs. So what about wind? Does the same hold true with wind? Um, so this is what the wind uh, looks like. If we've sized the wind to meet uh, the same load in zone seven on an energy basis. So the wind is not oversized at all. It's, it's just we, we've sized the wind capacity so that the aggregate uh, wind power produces as much energy as we need throughout the course of the year. So in this case, the problem is opposite. Uh, we have a summer shortfall and we have winter surpluses or winter spring surpluses in reality, which is kind of the opposite problem of what we had with PV. Um, so if we oversize wind optimally with a 2.7x overbuilt in this case, we also eliminate uh, these long drawdown periods. We have a year round surplus. There, there's no one month long period where the aggregate wind power produces less than the load, uh, the load that, that we're requiring it to meet. So the same is true. Overbuilding is very uh, valuable here. We move from 44 cents per kilowatt hour down to 6.2 cents per kilowatt hour at the optimum point to roughly uh, similar degree of uh, curtailment and overbuilding. Um, and I've highlighted the implicit storage portion here also in green. Um, so it's comparable to the PV LCOE. We were at a little bit over seven cents per kilowatt hour for PV um, in load resource zone seven. Wind is a little bit cheaper, uh, partially because the wind resource is, is very good up there in, uh, in Michigan. So 2050, high degree of technological development, MISO load resource zone seven, 100% wind plus storage, 6.2 cents per kilowatt hour. So what about a blend? Can we reduce costs further by hybridizing the resources? So let's look at wind plus PV. Um, so when we hybridize the two, as, as I mentioned earlier, as you saw in those two plots, uh, the wind and solar resource are diametrically opposed on a seasonal basis in this region at least, um, meaning that the sun produces more in the summer and the wind produces more in the winter spring um, and those play off each other and we can optimize the relative capacity of each. And that's what we've done here. This is an optimal wind PV blend um, and we're cheaper. We're cheaper than either individually. We're 24% cheaper at the sweet spot relative to wind alone and 52% cheaper relative to PV alone. So we're, we're cheaper not only at 0% curtailment, we're only at 21 cents per kilowatt hour, but we're cheaper at the sweet spot. We're at 4.7 cents per kilowatt hour. So, in this plot, the blue portion of the stacked area plot is the contribution that comes from wind. 
uh, the contribution of the L LCOE that comes to wind. The yellow part is the piece that comes from PV. And there's a little bit more wind here than there is PV on an energy basis. And that's just because of the, the strength of the, of the resource up there. There's a really high wind capacity factor in that part of the world. So 2050, high technological development, MISO load resource zone seven, 100% wind plus PV plus storage, where the wind and PV have been optimized. Um, we're at 4.7 cents per kilowatt hour. And this is with 28 gigawatts of wind, 42 gigawatts of PV, and 419 gigawatt hours of storage. So what about a larger region? How do the dynamics change here? So this was a this was the, one of the smallest regions we looked at, a load resource zone. What about uh, one of these more large uh, macro regions? So let's look at the MISO central region, which the uh, load resource zone seven uh, sits within. So for the central region, uh, we're marginally cheaper than load resource zone seven, but comparable in price. We moved from 4.7 cents per kilowatt hour to 4.6 cents per kilowatt hour at the sweet spot. Um, so the wind resource is a little bit less favorable than it is in load resource seven on the aggregate across the central region. Um, there's a, so there's a little bit more PV, as you can see in this plot, the yellow uh, portion of this secondary plot is a little bit bigger than it was before relative to the blue portion. That means there's a little bit more PV in this, in this optimum and it's marginally cheaper on the whole, but it's, but it's comparable. And in fact, when, when you look at the optimization between the degree of wind or solar, as, as we showed in the Minnesota results, um, there's a lot of wiggle room there. So whether you have a little bit more PV or a little bit more wind, you could have 60% wind, 40% uh, PV, or 60% uh, PV, 40% wind, and they're roughly uh, the same cost. You don't you don't change the LC, LCOE that much. So there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of wiggle room there in terms of the relative capacity. But a little bit of both, even if the wind resource is very strong, like it is in load resource zone seven, even a little bit of uh, the other resource helps out. So 2050, high technological development, MISO central region, 100% wind plus PV plus storage at 4.6 cents per kilowatt hour. This is with 52 gigawatts of wind, 243 gigawatts of PV and 1.6 terawatt hours of storage. So let's look at uh, all of MISO. Let, let's uh, expand the, the geographic scope to the entire MISO region. So MISO region is even marginally cheaper in the central region. We move from 4.6 cents per kilowatt hour to 4.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and there's more PV in the optimum wind solar uh, resource blend. And this is because now that we've expanded to all of MISO, we're capturing the southern region, which is, uh, which is very sunny as I showed in the uh, capacity factor plot. Um, so we, we decrease even more at the sweet spot and we have a little bit less curtailment at the optimum point. So 2050, high technological development, all of MISO, 100% wind plus PV plus storage at 4.2 cents per kilowatt hour. This is with 57 gigawatts of wind, 511 gigawatts of PV and 2.7 terawatt hours of storage. And the, the amount of the capacity of PV seems a lot bigger to wind, but remember the wind capacity factor, generally speaking, is over double that of PV. So, you know, multiply the, the actual energy penetration of wind and PV isn't reflective of these capacity numbers. You have to, if you, if you want to know the energy balance, the, the percentage um, of the energy that's met by wind and by PV, just multiply the the wind by a factor of two to get the, the right ratio because the capacities don't speak to that. So with 667 terawatt hours of annual usage across the MISO, uh, this equates to $28 billion of annual expenditures at this rate. So this is to say if, uh, if we have a levelized cost of electricity of 4.2 cents per kilowatt hour, so that, you know, a wholesale cost, um, and we multiply that by 667 terawatt hours of annual usage, that's a $28 billion of expenditures uh, to essentially make all of the, uh, make all of the economics worth out. So now LCOE is, um, that bundles up the costs and looks at the capital and operating costs. And this is the, this is the rate that these, uh, um, that these 
th this is the rate at which they need to be, uh, this is the amount of money that needs to come in in order to make the project whole, essentially. So what if each load resource zone optimized for themselves? What if we take, um, take ourselves out of the MISO context and, and each, instead of interconnecting across MISO, each load resource zone optimizes uh, the relative solar wind blend and the amount of overbuilding by themselves. So this is what the picture looks like. And there are two uh, factors on this map. Um, one is the color of each load resource zone. So if it's more yellow, uh, there's more PV in the optimum wind solar blend. And if it's more blue, there's more wind in the optimum wind solar blend. And the LCOE, the optimized LCOE at the sweet spot is pictured uh, within the middle of each zone. So you can see that load resource zone three is the cheapest in this case, and there's a little bit more wind. And this is because there's a huge amount of uh, wind resource in this region. So this is 3.81 cents per kilowatt hour. The most expensive is somewhere down here. I think it's uh, load resource zone eight, 5.47 cents per kilowatt hour. And this is a more solar heavy zone. Although none of them are completely yellow or completely blue. So there, there's none that are 100% um, PV or 100% wind. They all have a, a little bit of a mix, even load resource zone three with, it, with its really heavy uh, wind resource. So if you, each load resource zone island in themselves and optimize their resource blends, the electricity price would be uh, 4.65 cents per kilowatt hour. So that, that's a weighted average of the levelized cost of, of the LCOEs across each of these zones that are weighted by the, uh, the energy, the annual energy usage within each of these uh, zones. So this equates to roughly $31 billion per year. So interestingly, the MISO region interconnection will save ratepayers uh, $3 billion per year, roughly, we, we estimate. Um, because as I showed on the previous map, we're only at around $28, $28 billion per year if we interconnect across the entire MISO. And if we island each uh, load resource zone, we're at $31 billion per year. So that equates to a $3 billion per year savings. So the same is true if we look at isolating the, uh, the macro regions within MISO. So these are the optimized LCOEs for each uh, macro region. Um, and you can see the north region is the cheapest one because of the, uh, the high wind uh, capacity factors that you have up there. We're at 3.88 cents per kilowatt hour in the north region, but still with a little bit of PV. We're not completely blue, we're, we're kind of blue gray. So we're closer to the middle here. E each of them, none of them are completely solar, completely wind. That, that's a point that I wanna highlight. So the picture is similar if uh, uh, each MISO region islanded themselves individually. Uh, we're at 4.53 cents per kilowatt hour weighted average cost. And this equates to $30 billion per year. And this is still more expensive than the, the total cost if we interconnected the entire MISO region, which was $28 billion per year. So the, uh, if we island the, uh, the individual subregions within MISO, um, it will cost ratepayers $2 billion extra per year. So the MISO region interconnections essentially saves the people living within the MISO region uh, roughly $2 billion per year, we expect. So the larger the interconnection region, the lower the cost. Um, finally, what about adding 5% uh, new build gas as we did for Minnesota? So for Minnesota, I think we looked at um, some of the stranded gas assets, and we didn't include the, the uh, new, the cost of new build gas. So in this case, we are, we're building all new gas infrastructure. So we're including the capital and operating costs and fuel costs and all that um, in the LCOE mix. So the, the, the gas uh, LCOE is a bit higher because we're not leveraging the existing gas uh, resources, which is a pretty significant portion of the MISO grid. So this is a high bar for, for the gas cost. And just like in Minnesota, we do re, uh, reduce the cost. We're, we're about 17% cheaper uh, than 100% renewables across MISO. So this is 5% gas, and now we're at 95% renewables. Um, and there's significantly less optimal curtailment. So this is the important piece. Because the gas comes in when the storage otherwise would, we need less storage and less implicit storage.
So we need less uh, curtailment. Now we're only at 17% optimal curtailment, as you can see here, that the uh, sweet spot is further to the left of this plot um, compared to where it was before when we had no, uh, no gas, where we're at 36% optimal curtailment. So this could have uh, uh, benefits in, in that we don't, we don't need as much uh, curtailment, but then again, we need to build uh, some sort of quick ramping uh, uh, dispatchable infrastructure uh, that ramps up on demand when the storage otherwise would. Something needs to come in to, to match the shortfalls um, that the aggregate wind and solar resource uh, uh, present. So gas does the same job that implicit storage does. So key takeaways. The value of implicit storage. Implicit storage over building plus curtailment is highly cost effective in every case that we looked at even when we include gas, although it's, it's less effective because gas does the same job. Uh, the value of hybridizing wind plus PV. Wind and PV hybrid resources, resourcing is significantly cheaper than either alone due to the seasonal resource anti-correlations, even in areas that have uh, a dominant resource like low to resource zone seven, uh, very good wind resource. Uh, there's still a value in hybridizing the two. The impact of cost. Technological costs change the LCOEs dramatically and the technological mix that results. You raise the wind cost relative to the PV cost and you increase the optimal wind percentage. You raise the storage cost relative to the renewables um, and you increase the implicit storage use. And I'd like to point out that confidence and consensus uh, surrounding the cost will help solidify the planning process. Although the relative cost of wind and PV um, but between each other, there's a lot of wiggle room there. So if wind happens, ends up being much cheaper than, than is forecasted relative to where we forecast PV to be, um, you know, and we, we had planned for a different scenario, there's, there's still some wiggle room there and we're, we're still landing at roughly the same LCOEs. Um, PV is favored in 2050. Um, in 2050, high technological development scenarios favor PV in most regions given uh, the drastic production, uh, pro projected reduction capex. So that map that I showed for the load resource zones and for the, uh, and for the macro regions, they were mostly, they were further on the yellow side of the spectrum, meaning that there's a little bit more PV than there is wind generally on an energy basis. And that's because uh, the PV is project projected to be incredibly cheap uh, by that date. So, and this is despite a very strong wind resource in the northern part of MISO territory. So the exceptions include load resource zones three and seven, where the strong wind resources resource tilts this balance towards the wind side of the spectrum. Uh, the value of MISO, this is a very important part, and I think one of the critical takeaways of the, the entire study. The larger the region we interconnect across, the lower the aggregate cost. Um, on the whole, this will this is projected to save ratepayers billions annually, although how much exactly it saves is, is you know, it is tied to the, the, the actual costs that we end up getting for these different technologies and, and how, we, uh, how we pay for it. Yeah. So 95% renewables, uh, just like uh, in our Minnesota Solar Pathways portion of the study, um, in the SPA portion of the study, is it's significantly cheaper than 100%. So allowing for 5% gas or some other dispatchable gen to perform some of the work, otherwise done by storage, both implicit and real, um, is, uh, is, is much cheaper. It may also be more acceptable as it uh, reduces the amount of optimal curtailment significantly. So 100% MISO load, 30% wind, 65% solar, 5% gas, at 3.5 cents per kilowatt hour in 2050. That's, that's not bad. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any, uh, any and all questions. And also one final point. Uh, so there are a lot of scenarios here um, and I, I could only dive into a small segment of them. I tried to create a flow to, to get to some interesting ones, but there's a lot more results here to unpack. And uh, just like for Minnesota, I'll be putting up a, um, over the next week or two,
I'll be putting all these results up on the, on the web so you can dynamically look through them, download the time series, uh, look at the, you know, change the, uh, the, the, the change 2025 to 2050, change the uh, geographic scope and look at the impact on uh, LCOE uh, dynamically, uh, just like we did for Minnesota. So um, you, you can look forward to that at, at that time. So thank you very much. Happy to take any and all uh, questions from, from anyone listening. You've got a couple in the chat here, Mark. Um, and either folks, I, I can read them, or if folks, Warren or Robbie, if your questions weren't answered, if you wanted, you can also just feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask. We don't have very many people on the line today. If we want to make oh, it I see more the, conversational. I see the questions. Okay, I see super. The questions. Okay, let's see. Is the curtailment number from zero to 80% from, this is from Warren Hess. Is the curtailment number from zero to 80% or more the amount of curtailment expected for any given area due to lack of transmission? Um, no, so that the curtailment is, um, is part of the dispatch strategy. So the curtailment just happens when, so, so we, we allocate, uh, we allocate, we, we identify the uh, storage capacity, we identify the PV and wind capacity. If um, PV and wind capacity if the storage is full, if the storage is already full at a given moment and there's excess wind and, uh, wind and solar capacity relative to load that we're trying to meet, well, then we curtail at that point. So it's, it's part of the dispatch strategy. And if the, uh, so that, that's, that's the only time we, we truly curtail. It's when, uh, when there's too much wind and solar capacity. So if we're overbuilding the, uh, the gen capacity for wind and solar, um, we're going to be doing that a lot more. So there's a lot more curtailment if we overbuild. If we 2X the, um, uh, if, if we multiply the, if we build two kilowatts of PV for every one kilowatt that we need on an energy basis, um, well then we're gonna be curtailing 50% of the time to meet the same load because we're gonna be producing, the, stor the storage is going to be full a lot more um, and then it otherwise would. So we need, we need less storage. The curtailment's a, a means to, uh, to get less storage. Because we, we, have less, uh, we, less, we have less energy balances throughout the course of the year. I don't know if that answers your, uh, your question. So transmission constraints were not, uh, were not considered in here. So that's definitely a consideration. We save money on, a, um, on, a, uh, on an energy basis by interconnecting the MISO region. But is that two to three billion dollars a year in savings by interconnecting the MISO region? Does, is that um, allayed by the? Uh, or, or does that equal the um, the cost that it will take annually to upgrade the transmission grids in order to get good power flow interconnectivity? I know there's a there's a significant transmission constraint between the northern and southern parts of the of the MISO. Um, we'll beefing up that that uh, critical point in the, uh, the transmission grid, will that, uh, you know, w w will that, will that cost more than the two to $3 billion that are saved by interconnecting across the region? That's a question I can't answer because we didn't look at it, but I think it's an interesting one. Okay. From Brian Ross to everyone is the solar and wind resource maps beginning of the presentation. Um, what is the spread on capacity factor for each resource across MISO? I would expect that the best to worst difference is larger for wind than for solar. That's correct, Brian. And I didn't put a legend on there, but maybe I should have now. I have the legend and I can send that to you. Yes, there's, there's, there's far less um, difference in capacity factor for solar from the northern to the southern part than there is uh, in terms of wind. Wind, there's, there's really very little in the south, um, at least on land. And uh, that's part of the reason why... Uh, you don't see wind completely dominating in the north as you'd expect because there's still a good chunk of solar. And we saw that with the Minnesota results too. We, despite the really high wind resource in the state of Minnesota, we still saw a roughly 50-50 blend in these 2050 uh, cost scenarios uh, between wind and solar on an energy basis. I think it was 55% uh, wind and 45% solar, something like that for Minnesota. Um, and that's despite the fact that there's a really high wind resource. There's still a pretty good solar resource up there, despite being so far north. So that's a good question. So any other questions? That seems to be the last uh, last question. But you know, 
I'm open to answer uh, any questions by, uh, by email also if necessary. Mark, there's another question in the, in the chat queue from Rabbi. Um, MISO yeah. extends into Manitoba, which is, has a large hydro resource. Yep. Was this considered in a similar way as gas to offer ramping resources and reducing no. costs? No, we, di we didn't look at hydro uh, in Manitoba this time. We, 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 um, we didn't look at the existing resources in Minnesota. We're saying we're going to start from a clean slate. We know what the load is in each of these load resource zones, in each of the, uh, the subregions, and in, uh, for the entire MISO. And we're going to start from a clean slate and set a high bar for the cost, just looking at wind, solar, storage, and gas in this case. But you're right, you know, instead of building brand new gas like we considered in the last uh, series of slides here, if you have existing resource resources, be they gas, or hydropower that can provide dispatchability, uh, then they can operate in the same way and have the same effect with less impact to the LCOE. So that the last LCOE that I showed, 3.5 cents per kilowatt hour, it would be even lower if we used existing dispatchable resources, which would probably be the case. So that's why I said at the beginning of the presentation that this is kind of a high watermark, a high bar for, uh, for costs across the region. I don't know if that answers your question, Robbie. Yeah, that does. Thanks, Mark. That's uh, very helpful and interesting. Excellent. And, you know, so, so I, I could only dive into a small segment of the results here. And I apologize for that because there, there are a lot of interesting things here and comparisons to make. Um, but I, I hope that uh, I'll, I'll send out the link to, uh, to the, uh, the TC here within the coming weeks, weeks and you can uh, uh, you know, look look on the uh, the dynamic web page that I mentioned, and dive through all of the scenarios to your to your heart's content, and you know, do some some comparisons of your own of, of your own for each of these regions. Uh, uh, Mark, this is, this is Brian. Um, uh, kind of it's kind of similar to Robbie's question. Uh, in Minnesota, we looked at flexible loads as, as an offsetting strategy that had, I think, ultimately like a ten percent cost impact on the final kind of uh, uh, numbers. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that you did not look at um, the kind of flexible load scenario across the entire MISO footprint. I mean, is that something that would also, I mean, have, have, can we assume that it would have a positive cost impact if we started saying, well, let's also use, you know, all the EVs that will be on, on the, uh, you know, on the system in 2050 as, uh, as a component of flexible load in order to kind of uh, as, as a replacement for storage. Absolutely. You know, we, we didn't look at that specifically, like you mentioned, but um, yes, it would have a, I expected to have a very similar impact. We also didn't look at, as we did in Minnesota, the, uh, the way that the load shape changes um, and it's expected to change significantly from the electrification of uh, not only transport, but of um, heating loads. Um, so, uh, CEE did some great work on that for us for Minnesota. Um, and you could see the, uh, the temporal shape of the load. It starts to increase a lot in the winter because if we're electrifying heating, especially in the northern regions. So that, um, because the wind produces a little bit more in the winter and, and, um, and spring and fall than, than solar does, um, you tend to see a little bit more wind resources in, in, these, uh, in these optimal mixes. Um, so that's something that's it's interesting that we didn't look at specifically in here, but uh, it's something to be expected across the MISO region also. And there's another uh, another question here from Cynthia Bartu. Can you remind us whether you're looking only utilities cost deployment of solar? Uh, while there is very little small scale wind market, the small to mid scale market for solar will be bigger. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so this is a cost optimization model. And for the Minnesota portion of the work, um, we did have costs that were linked to the type of solar development. So we had community scale solar. We had a blend within each bracket. We had community scale, we had utility scale, we had residential scale solar, and we had a blend of those. Um, in this case, we're just using the utility scale cost to simplify things, to, to create less scenarios. But sure, the, um, the utility and community scale solar will just be a little bit more expensive, but it might be more palatable. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic to, to that in all honesty. 
um, I'm, I'm in full support. There are distribution grid benefits um, that have cost implications also. Um, and there's resiliency benefits and whatnot that we didn't consider here. This is just meeting um, energy. This is the macro scale energy uh, balancing uh, costs. So this is truly just meeting load without considering the uh, all the distribution grid costs and benefits that you would get from uh, moving to these different uh, types of, of uh, solar deployment. So that's a good question. Thank you. Any other, uh, any other questions? And by the way, I'm happy to take any questions by, uh, by, by email also afterwards if, if we run out of time. Okay, how much present natural gas heating do you see moving to electric heat? That's a great question. I think this would be a better question posed to, uh, uh, to CEE because they did the work on the electrification. Um, they looked, I believe, at, at uh, moving all of the heating to electrify. I mean, CEE would be a better person to answer because they did the electrification work for us for, uh, for the Minnesota portion. Robbie, do you have an answer to that? Uh, I don't have an answer to that, but I'd be happy to pass any questions along uh, to my colleague, Josh Quinnell, who conducted that research. If, uh, uh, if Warren, you wanted to uh, follow up with me or give me your email address, I'd be happy to uh, follow up with you offline. Uh, this is Brian, and I, and I should point out that in, I think it's the, the electrification futures study that NREL did. Um, kind of did look nationally at that at some scenarios of moving uh, natural gas heating to electrification across the entire nation and they have some kind of state by state breakdowns of that at the very least it might uh, also shed some light on that there's another question coming in here from Cynthia um, Excel energy is predicting that their total load will increase by 60 percent by 2050 due to electrification okay well that's a great it's a great thing to know and that electrification, you know, part of that comes from transport, part of that comes from heat. I think a little bit more from heat, but I'm, I mean, that's a better question for CEE because they did the electrification work. But you're right, um, uh, that's going to have huge implications and it's going to change the shape of the load relative to the resources. So you'll probably see, like we saw in Minnesota, a little bit more wind in the optimum blends um, just because the wind resource is better suited to meeting uh, winter loads than solar is. But as I showed, even even if um, even if the shape is very conducive to to wind, we we still see some benefits from from a blend of both, just because it flattens the aggregate uh, uh, resource picture. Okay, Maggie Christian you mentioned resiliency. This analysis illustrates a scenario for what prices might look like in the energy market. Do you factor in the ancillary services market at all? It might be negligible, but depending on how different resources offer into uh, what market wouldn't they fall into different resource stack and change the fuel uh, mix slash price? Um, sure, this is this is a purely cost optimization. So this is behind the uh, the energy markets. So this is the cost of production. This would be equivalent to if if I were to build all of the resources that I mentioned here in this project myself, um, this would be the cost that I would need to bid into the market in order to make myself whole at, at um, given, uh, given whatever discount rate I chose, which I think was 4% in, in this, uh, this analysis. Um, in reality, you know, the, the market adds a whole nother layer of complexity because people are bidding in with some margin um, above their cost based on what they think other people are gonna bid in at basically. Um, so this doesn't consider the market dynamics whatsoever in, in this analysis. This is just a cost uh, cost optimization. So this is behind behind the market. I don't know if that answers your question. Or if you yeah, and, and just uh, 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 Miss, I'm sorry. Was somebody trying to get in? No, go go for it, Brian. Um, yeah, this is Brian. Um, and just to kind of follow on Maggie's. Question: I, you know, I, there's this whole notion of of the of the ancillary services markets, of course, that that renewables can play. But there's also this, and I think we discussed this in the Minnesota um, analysis about all of the capacity that is that uh, we're now calling uh, storage. Um, there's there's unused 
energy capacity in there that also has a value potentially if people start finding loads that can be that are flexible enough to to meet that um, and that is also another component that really wasn't incorporated in the, either the Minnesota piece or the or this one because it's just it's, it's very speculative but we just know that it's we know it's positive a positive value but we have no idea how much it is is, is would that be fair to say I, th I think so I think so there's certainly value there and you know, th this, this analysis shows that this implicit storage, this overbuilding of the renewable assets relative to what you need on an energy basis, um, we, we, can, we can essentially run resistors in the desert uh, to curtail that electricity, and that would still be cheaper than the storage we'd otherwise have needed. Um, so that's, that's all that this implicit storage does, is it allays the use of storage. And that might have some environmental benefits also, because you know, at least battery storage uh, comes with its own, you know, embodied energy and emb embodied carbon, um, which may or may not, which, which is probably much larger than the embodied energy and carbon included in the marginal solar and wind that you replace that storage with. 